Hi there. So today I want to talk to you about Newton's third law and also Newton's law of universal gravitation. This complements um, sections 3.2, 3.4, and 3.17 in your Matter and Interactions textbook. So first, Newton's third law. In your Matter and Interactions textbook, they also refer to Newton's third law as reciprocity. Okay. All right. So first remember that any time a force is exerted on an object, that force is caused by another object, okay? So for example, in gravity between the Earth and the Moon, the mass of the Earth creates a force on the Moon, pulling it towards it. So Newton's third law says that whenever one object exerts a force on a second object, that that second object exerts an equal force in the opposite direction on the first. Okay? This is also called action-reaction pairs. So, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. You may have heard that phrasing before on Newton's third law. Basically, it's as it is in this little graphic right here. Let's say that I take my hand and I push on the table. I'm pushing on the table, but the table pushes back on me. So, for the force that I exert downward on the desk, there's going to be an equal and opposite force exerted on my hand by that desk. All right? So they come in pairs. That's why the term reciprocity applies really well. So one of the keys to not getting messed up in your head when you're thinking about all this is that the forces are exerted on different objects. Make sure that you don't use them as if they were acting on the same object. So for example, it's not like the force on the desk sums to zero because I'm pushing on the desk and the desk is pushing back on me, right? That's not the case. If that were the case, we could never move anything, okay? So I push on the desk, the desk pushes on me. So one is a force on the desk and one is a force on me. So you don't sum those forces up, okay? Mathematically, you would express Newton's third law as that the force on object one by object two is equal to the negative force on object two by one. Okay, so they're going to be the same magnitude but in opposite directions. Now here's a word about normal forces. Okay, this is something that we haven't yet discussed in this class. A normal force is a force exerted by a surface against an object that's pressing against it. So I already gave you two examples. I said that the force was pushing on the desk and the desk was pushing back. Well, the, when the desk pushes back, that's a normal force, right? And that acts on me. When the skater is pushing off of the wall there, she's pushing on the wall, but the wall pushes back. And that's a normal force on the skater from the wall. Normal here means perpendicular, right? So we're using the geometry definition of the word normal, not normal as in every day, okay? Now the root of this force, the source of it, it comes from the molecular bonds in the material. Okay, so basically there was a repulsion there, okay? When you try to push on a desk, your hand doesn't go through the desk, right? The electromagnetic forces there keep your hand from going through the desk and they push back on you, all right? Now yet again, normal means perpendicular. So normal forces are always perpendicular to the surface that causes them. So here I have a little graphic of an inclined plane, okay? And the normal force on this little box from the inclined plane per points perpendicular, okay, to the plane. So it doesn't just point up, so a lot of students make the mistake of they draw the weight of the object down and then they draw the normal force up, which is the case if it's a flat surface. But if the incline is tilted like the one here, then the normal force is going to point perpendicular from the surface itself. Also be careful when you're doing these Newton's third law pairs not to add a third party into the third law, okay? So for example, a lot of students think that, let's say that you have a monitor here like you do in this, and the monitor is sitting on a desk. So they say that the force of gravity is down and the normal force is up, and that's the Newton's third law pair to the monitor, but that's incorrect, okay? What would happen is the Earth is pulling downward on the monitor. Now, that also means the Newton's third law, the, mo the uh, monitor is pulling up on the Earth, and we'll talk more about that in a second. So that's the Newton law pair, right? Monitor, Earth, Earth, monitor. 
the desk gets in the way, okay? So gravity pulls downward on the monitor. The desk gets on the, in the way, and so you have gravity from that monitor pulling downward, and then that ends up pushing on the desk, and then the desk pushes back. But be careful not to mix up your Newton's third law pairs, right? That normal force is the action-reaction pair for the monitor on desk and desk on monitor, not monitor on earth, right? The action-reaction pair there would be earth on monitor, right? Earth on monitor, monitor on earth, okay? So don't get mixed up. Okay, having said that, let's now launch into a discussion of Newton's law of universal gravitation, okay? So, we talked in a previous lecture about the force of gravity here on Earth, and we said that F was equal to m times little g, where m is the mass of the object, and little g is the acceleration due to gravity, which is minus 9.8 meters per second squared down towards the center of the Earth, okay? So, that force of gravity that's being exerted on objects on Earth, what's the origin of that force, okay? Newton realized that that force had to come from the Earth. And then he realized that the same force that keeps us and pulls us down towards the center of the Earth is the force that acts between the Earth and the Moon, right? And it's the force that keeps the Moon in its orbit. He actually envisioned a cannon that he, launched, he put on a tall mountain. And he thought if the mountain was tall enough and the cannonball got fired fast enough, like uh, there was no air, like in space, for example, so that there would be no drag on the cannonball, then what would eventually happen is that the cannonball would be launched and it would orbit the Earth just like the Moon orbits the Earth. So that was the mental picture that he had. I have a link down here to a Wikipedia page, and you can look at it. There's some animations about Newton's cannon that you might find interesting. So this gravitational force on you is one half of the third law pair. The Earth exerts a downward force on you, and you exert an upward force on the Earth. But since you're so much less massive than the Earth, the reaction force is undetectable. But if you have bodies that are more equal in mass, like a binary star system, for example, then it's significant, okay? All right, so the gravitational force has to be proportional to the size of the objects. More massive objects are going to pull more strongly, right? Now, by observing planetary orbits, Newton concluded that the gravitational force must decrease as the inverse of the square of the distance between the masses. We put mathematically Newton's law of universal gravitation in this form. The force F is equal to minus G times the product of the masses, M1 times M2, divided by the distance center to center between object one and two, which I call here magnitude of r squared, and then times the unit vector pointing from one object to another object, okay? So f is equal to minus g m1 m2 r hat over magnitude of r squared. That's Newton's law of universal gravitation. g here is the gravitational constant. It's 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meter squared per kilogram squared in SI units. Now, the value of little g, right, was proven in a laboratory by Cavendish. So anytime you do science, it's always a good idea to verify what you've learned by using another technique, okay? Using a completely independent experiment and another technique. So that's what Cavendish did. His experiment was basically like it's shown here in the graphic. He had two masses connected by a light rod in between them. In the middle of these two masses, in the middle of the light rod, he had a fiber, okay, a metal fiber that was attached there, okay? Now on the fiber there was a mirror. Now what would happen is he would bring another mass near one of the other two masses. He would bring it near. And then what would happen is, due to Newton's law of universal gravitation, those masses would feel an attractive force. And so what would happen is the rods and the masses on the rods would pivot towards the mass A there in that figure. It would pivot towards it. When it would pivot towards it, that would also turn the mirror. Now he had a light source that he aimed at the mirror and then the light source would bounce off the mirror and onto a scale, okay, that was somewhere nearby. 
and then he observed the deflection of the light source on that scale and he used that to quantify how much torsion, how much torque that got. Okay? And then from that, he used Newton's, Newton's law of universal gravitation and back calculated it. Knowing the masses, he could figure out what g was. So this is the Cavendish experiment, and it was originally performed by Henry Cavendish in 1789, and it was an independent lab-based verification of Newton's law of universal gravitation. Newton himself did the derivation where he showed through calculations what the orbit of the moon would be like. So he had already done another experimental test of his uh, equation, but Cavendish independently verified it in a different experiment. Now Newton also reasoned that larger mass should exert greater forces on one another, and he reasoned that the same mass that appears in Newton's second law, the m and f equals ma, should appear in the law of gravitation. So this is known as the principle of equivalence. The mass is the mass is the mass, in other words. And it doesn't matter what law you're putting it into. Okay, let's talk nitty gritty about how we would use Newton's law of universal gravitation. So here it is, F is equal to minus G, M1, M2 over R squared, R hat. Now this is an example of an inverse square law. We're gonna talk about another inverse square law, Coulomb's law, in this chapter. Basically, when I say inverse square, the magnitude of the force varies as the inverse square of the separation between the particles, okay? Now, since it's a force, of course it's a vector. And it's an attractive force. So here I have my blue and my orange mass, and you can see that the uh, vector of the force points from object one to object two, if you're talking about the force on mass one, or it points from object two towards object one, if you're talking about the orange ball, okay? So it acts along a line that connects the center of the two bodies. So we're going to talk about the relative position vector, and you might also use this interchangeably as a displacement vector, right? So for example, the R in this equation, right, that's on the bottom of that square right there, that is the vector that connects mass 1 to mass 2. Now, if you've got an origin of your coordinate system that's at some other place, rather than the centers of mass 1 and mass 2, for example, like here, then you have a position vector that points from the origin to mass 1, and that's vector R1. And you have a position vector that points from the origin to the center of mass 2, and that's vector R2. But those aren't the vectors you're interested in if you're trying to plug into the law of universal gravitation. You need the vector that points between our uh, mass one and mass two. And that's your relative position vector or displacement vector. So what you do to find that vector is you say that R is equal to R2 minus R1. And it's shown here um, in this little graphic as pointing from mass one to mass two. Okay, so that's what you plug in to Newton's law of universal gravitation. So, how do we calculate the gravitational force? What steps would we use in a problem? Okay, so here we go. The steps are the same. First, calculate the relative position vector, r, which is r2 minus r1. That should be your first step. Then calculate the magnitude of your relative position vector, okay? And that's the distance between the two bodies, center to center. Then, once you have that, you can calculate the magnitude of your force. Sorry, here. Right? The magnitude of your force will be gravitational constant G times M1, M2 over R squared. So that's your magnitude. Next, you're going to calculate the direction that the vector points. That's your negative R hat vector. Okay? And then finally, you're going to multiply the magnitude times the direction. Okay? So let me do an example problem because an example is worth a million words. This is number 13 in chapter 3 from Matter and Interactions. The mass of the Earth is 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms, and the mass of the Moon is 7 times 10 to the 22 kilograms. At a particular instant, the Moon is at location 2.8 times 10 to the 8th, 0, minus 2.8 times 10 to the 8th meters, in a coordinate system whose origin is at the center of the Earth. So what is R m minus e, the relative position vector from the Earth to the Moon? What's the magnitude of this vector? What's the unit vector? And what's the gravitational force exerted by the Earth on the Moon? So you can see that this question takes you through, kind of steps you through the steps that you're supposed to use every time to calculate uh, Newton's law of universal gravitation. All right, so let's do these things. Let's do them in order, okay? All right, 
the position vector for the moon was given to you in the problem. And the position vector for the Earth was implicitly stated because they said that it was at the origin of the coordinate system, right? All right, so the R of M minus E would be R for the M, the position vector for the moon, minus the position vector for Earth. So that would be 2.8 times 10 to the 8, 0, minus 2.8 times 10 to the 8 meters, minus 0, 0, 0, the position vector for the Earth. So that just gives us back the position vector for the moon, okay, which is 2.8 times 10 to the 8, 0, minus 2.8 times 10 to the 8 meters. So there's our position vector, right, our relative position vector. The next step in the calculation is to take the magnitude of this relative position vector. When you take the magnitude of any vector, it's the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. So that would be equal to the square root of 2.8 times 10 to the 8th squared plus 0 squared plus minus 2.8 times 10 to the 8th squared. And then you take the square root of that. When I did that, I ended up with the magnitude of 3.96 times 10 to the 8th meters. Lots of times when I'm doing a calculation, I'll keep digits and then round to the correct number of sig figs at the end. Okay, next step is to calculate the negative of the unit vector, r hat, okay? So, if you remember how we take, uh, uh, how we find a unit vector, we take each component of the unit vector, the x, y, and z of the regular vector, and then we divide it by the magnitude of the vector to get the components of that unit vector. So applied here, sorry, there should be an M there. Let me put that in, M and M, okay. So applied here, that would mean that my negative of my unit vector would be negative, parentheses, 2.8 times 10 to the eighth divided by 3.96 times 10 to the eighth for the I hat direction. And that's because the X component of my relative position vector is 2.8 times 10 to the 8th, but the magnitude of the whole vector I already found was 3.96 times 10 to the 8th, okay? So that's the X component, 2.8 times 10 to the 8th divided by 3.96 times 10 to the 8th. Now my Y component is 0 because my relative position vector has a Y component of 0, so that's 0. And then my Z component would be minus 2.8 times 10 to the 8th divided by 3.96 times 10 to the 8th. Okay, so when I do the division here, plug and chug in with my numbers, that gives me negative r hat is negative 0.707 i hat plus 0.707 k hat. And of course, the j hat uh, component is zero. Okay, so that's my negative unit vector. Okay, next I wanna find the magnitude of my force. So I plug that into the equation g m1 m2 over r squared. So g is 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11 newton meter squared per kilogram squared. m1 times m2 is 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms times 7 times 10 to the 22 kilograms. And then I divide by the center to center distance squared, 3.96 times 10 to the 8th squared. Plugging that into a calculator, I end up with a magnitude of the force of 1.8 times 10 to the 20th newtons. Okay, so now the final step is to multiply what I got for the magnitude of my force times the negative unit vector. So plugging in for that, F is equal to minus R hat times magnitude of F. Magnitude of F is 1.8 times 10 to the 20th newtons, and then I'm multiplying that times my unit vector, which is minus 0.707 I hat plus 0.707 K hat. When I do that, I end up with a force of minus 1.3 times 10 to the 20th newtons in the i hat direction, right? Plus 1.3 times 10 to the 20th newtons in the k hat direction. And of course, a zero component for the y, all right? Now, if you check the answer in the back of the book, I think they forgot to square their distance in the bottom there, and so they get something with the wrong order of magnitude, okay? Um, the, this is the correct answer, though. I've checked it a billion times. <laughs> all right. Well, I hope you found that uh, useful. And um, if you have any questions, let me know. Remember, you can always pause me if I go too fast when it's a video. So it makes it better than real life in some ways. And I'll see you in class.